Hey gang, this week's episode is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. Yes, unlimited video learning with the world's greatest professors, including the brand new course, Fundamentals of Photography. Check it out at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash goodseats. You'll get a free month for a limited time of all the great coursework at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash goodseats for your free month. Check it out. Here's our show. Basketball, like any sport, is made up of dreams. And for any basketball player, the greatest dream is to play professional basketball. Here in the United States, there are 600,000 youngsters playing high school basketball. Collegiately, the number of players, about 30,000. But in the pro ranks, the NBA and the CBA, that number, less than 400. 396 of those players good enough to play professional basketball. For years, college basketball was thought of as the great pipeline to the National Basketball Association. But over the last several years, a new road has developed to the NBA, the Continental Basketball Association. And over these next 30 minutes, we'll talk to a number of people about that. We'll talk with former New York Knick great Cassie Russell, currently a coach here on the CBA. We'll also talk with Michael Adams, the great point guard for the Denver Nuggets, who honed his skills here in the Continental Basketball Association. We'll speak with Carl Shear, the general manager of the Charlotte Hornets and the former commissioner of the CBA. Also, Kevin Loggery, the great NBA veteran coach, about the CBA's impact at the NBA level. And we'll look at the current crop of CBA all-stars and great players, the next generation of players in the NBA. As we take a look at the Continental Basketball Association, the CBA, the new road to the NBA. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right. Yes, we did. We're going back to hoops. Absolutely. Hi, my name is Tim Hanlon. This is Good Seats Still Available. Yes, it's the curious little podcast. It's our journey each and every week into what used to be in professional sports. And uh, I thank you for finding us. And uh, for those of you who enjoyed, uh, and by the way, quite a few of you did, our episode about two months back on the uh, our first uh, exploration of the Continental Basketball Association with our guest at the time, David Levine, uh, we talked a lot about the 1980s uh, version of the Continental Basketball Association, the CBA, uh, and in particular, the team that uh, he kind of followed for a season and made a book out of uh, the 1988 89 uh, version of the Albany New York Patroons. We got such a, an overwhelming response to that episode and requests, frankly, to go deeper in the CBA. We said, well, why not? And and why wait? And uh, this week, uh, you will be treated to another uh, delve into the history of the CBA with this week's guest, Rob Brown, who was the voice of the 1990s team. 91 through 2001 or so called a Fort Wayne Fury. Yes. Fort Wayne, Indiana. And the Fury were uh, uh, quite a team, had a couple of uh, standout seasons for sure. In particular, the uh, 1997, 98 season were uh, the regular season champions of the uh, the CBA uh, and continued to do a little damage in the, uh, in the playoffs uh, at that. But this conversation uh, with Rob Brown, the former voice of the Fort Wayne Fury, we, we, you know, another quintessential uh, dive into the CBA, but another decade uh, or so of which we get into uh, some of the curious stories uh, of this particular team. And and we get into very interesting things, such as some great players and coaches like Keith Smart, who went on to be a, a, a quite a solid uh, head coach in the NBA. He was part of the uh, coaching staff of the Fury, as was, by the way. A guy by the name of Rick Barry, he was also the coach of the Fort Wayne Fury uh, at uh, various points during the uh, 1990s. We get into the story of Master P, yes, the the renowned rapper who in the late 90s uh, fancied himself as uh, getting a, a cup of coffee or a shot at the NBA. And, and the first place to show how serious he was, was playing for the Fort Wayne Fury of the CBA, and uh, we'll get into some of the conversations about how Percy Miller, his uh, his real name, better known as Master P, did in that process and uh, his various tryouts with NBA teams. We get into all kinds of stuff. We talk about Fort Wayne, Indiana, generally. Uh, for those of you uh, young whippersnappers out there who uh, 
perhaps fancied themselves as a, as a broadcaster in the uh, overnight hours, perhaps like I was uh, listening on the East Coast uh, to distant radio signals. You probably knew and heard of a very strong clear channel AM station called WOWO, W-O-W-O in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's still around. That was the uh, the flamethrower broadcast signal, not only the Fort Wayne Fury, but the the other team that shared the Allen County War Memorial Coliseum in Fort Wayne, that being the Fort Wayne Comets. Uh, we get into all that, too. We also get into the curious story, one that uh, still is, uh, uh, you know, uh, hard to believe, the nationally uh, attention-grabbing fall of uh, the Fort Wayne Fury's mascot from, uh, it wasn't the ceiling, but it was, a, it was a dramatic fall of their mascot. His name was Saber. Uh, in uh, 19, uh, I guess it was 1998 or so. It was just a, a tragic accident. 1996, actually. It was, uh, he fell 50 feet uh, from a cable doing some kind of stunt and uh, it was uh, national headlines and frankly, not the kind of headlines the Fury were looking for. But again, and luckily he was okay at the end of the day. Uh, we get into that story too. There's a whole bunch of other sort of crazy stuff, but all the kinds of things you would expect from a team in the Continental Basketball Association. And that's our conversation this week with the former Fort Wayne Fury voice, Rob Brown, coming up in just a couple of moments. And uh, you will enjoy it. I uh, I pretty much assure you of that. Before we get to our conversation with Rob, uh, we want to say hello and uh, welcome again to our friends at 503 Sports. Uh, as you know, they fancy themselves as the king of throwbacks. And you will find out more about them and their wares at 503 dash sports.com yes 503 don't forget the dash sports.com and uh, use that promo code good seats to get 10 percent off any of those items uh, that you may find at 503 sports and uh, as we're since we're talking about basketball again this week i do want to mention that 503 sports not only has a, a tremendous assortment of great logo throwback uh, t-shirts uh, from uh, in particular the old aba uh, but they also, as they do for a whole bunch of other sports, not just have those cool shirts. And by the way, they're, they're, they're smart looking by all means. The colors, the logos, they're all terrific. They also uh, specialize, 503 Sports does, in these uh, originally crafted throwback jerseys. Uh, they're fantastic. And if you're looking for an Anaheim Amigos jersey or a Pittsburgh Condors jersey, how about a San Diego Conquistadors Jersey. Remember the Houston Mavericks? You can get their jersey too, as well as all of the other, most of the other, not all of them, but most of them of the old ABA. These are all lovingly handcrafted and uh, and recreated jerseys. And boy, oh boy, you're going to really stand out amongst your friends uh, when you're showing up at that party with the uh, Utah Stars jersey, or perhaps that Washington Caps jersey, or maybe even that New Jersey Americans jersey. You can get in that long-winded conversation about how the Americans were the first ABA franchise in New Jersey before they became the uh, New Jersey Nets, the often lamentable New Jersey Nets, now in Brooklyn, of all places. So uh, that's all there for you to enjoy and to find. And I guarantee you're going to find some really cool stuff there. Please check them out at 503 Sports. And again, that the website is 503-sports.com. Use the promo code SEATS, S-E-A-T-S, SEATS, for 10% off all of your purchases and uh, we thank 503 Sports and uh, its uh, master of ceremonies out there, Dustin Alameda. We thank him and them for their sponsorship of this wacky little show. All right. Let uh, the wackiness continue coming up. Let's get into it. Let's get into more CBA basketball, 1990s variety, specifically in the uh, bustling hamlet of Fort Wayne, Indiana, with our guest, Rob Brown. Here's our great chat. We hope you enjoy it for sure. Here it is. Obviously, a couple of weeks back, we had uh, a, a really a fun conversation. I guess our initial foray into the Continental Basketball Association, you were kind enough to send me a note. David Levine, I think, had a really good encapsulation of a certain era of the CBA, right? That year, the late sort of late 80s and stuff when things were kind of Amalgamating, but uh, you were part of the Fort Wayne Fury team, which really was kind of a story more of the 90s version of the CBA. Is that right? No question. Yeah. Yeah. So I had stumbled across, um, and I, I forget now how, but I came across your podcast probably uh, eight or nine months ago. And then 
began consuming it regularly and really enjoying it and then heard that episode. And I had read that book back maybe a year or two after it came out. And that was probably two or three years before I started actually working in the league. Um, so it was an interesting perspective to read that book and then actually work in the league for seven years. Um, and, and you're right. It was a different, that was kind of, uh, that late eighties, early nineties was really uh, when the CBA was probably at its peak from a, certainly from a team and a franchise size standpoint in terms of the number of franchises. And then it, it peaked about in the mid nineties and then started to taper down from there until it, in its in its original format went away in 2001 well before we get there what let, let's let's back up a bit and and just give us a little bit of uh, your trajectory how did you even get involved with this uh crazy league and the team in particular uh in the first place sure sure so um so i went to uh undergraduate at miami university in ohio and then went to graduate school at syracuse and got a broadcasting degree and was looking for a job and um interviewed in Fort Wayne and was initially hired um, as the radio analyst for home games primarily. I did a handful of road games that first two years I was there, and that was in 93. So that would have been the the third and fourth years of the franchise. Um, And then the the guy who was the play-by-play man left and went to the franchise in Florida And so I was hired on as the play-by-play guy, was there about two weeks, and uh, they fired the PR director. So I also then became the PR director. So that was the kind of the dual role that I held then from uh, the 95-96 season through the end of the uh, 99-2000 season. And then I left, at the end of that season, I left to go work in the PR department for the Clippers in Los Angeles. Did you imagine that basketball was kind of uh, your sport or was it just it was a gig coming out of college and get that uh, entree and uh, and that sort of first level of experience? Oh, yeah. Um, You know, growing up in Indiana, basketball was my first love, Um, like probably a lot of uh, kids in Indiana growing up. You know, everybody hits a ceiling. Mine was in eighth grade in terms of playing. (laughs) So I had to find another way to stay around it. So, yeah, I'm, I would have taken a, a radio job, a play-by-play job anywhere uh, doing what have, you know, baseball, football, whatever. I, I wasn't qualified to do hockey because I didn't grow up around hockey. Um, but basketball was, was certainly my first choice. So to be able to get in a – be in a position to uh, have a play-by-play job in professional basketball was uh, – was an ideal scenario for me. All right. Well, when you say professional basketball, let's uh, let's really put the, let's frame that right. So, for those who have not listened to our, our episode uh, from a number of weeks back with uh, David Levine, I encourage you to either pause this one and listen to that one first, or immediately after finishing this conversation, go and uh, go and listen to it. We, we kind of established in some of those convers that, that conversation that. You know, the CBA was, you know, quasi-professional, maybe be the best way to sort of describe it. I mean, it wasn't officially a minor league to the NBA, although clearly the by that time in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a lot more of a, um, I don't know, a, a warm and fuzzy feeling between the two, uh, albeit somewhat uh, inelegant uh, at times. Yeah, I think that's a good description. And, and, you know, you were at that point in the early to mid-90s, you were having – 35 to 40 players at some point during the season getting called up to the NBA. Now, most of those guys were on 10 day contracts, so they'd go and then they'd eventually come back. Um, probably one in four of those guys, uh, you know, when they would go up, they would stick for an, the, the remainder of a season. Um, when I first received uh, the opportunity and was hired on, uh, you know, especially explaining what I was doing to my relatives, um, I always explained that it was like AAA baseball, but without the affiliation. Um, it certainly was, in terms of quality of play and, and the ability level of the players, uh, it was the second best league in the world behind the NBA. Well, that's interesting, right? I mean, given that uh, the European game certainly was, uh, you know, gaining steam and certainly the, the, the sport was gaining a lot more, shall we say, a professional 
you know, experience around the world, right? So, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's 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 obviously interesting in hindsight, right? Because now with the G League, which is obviously owned by the NBA and stuff, right? The the idea of of a minor league system, right? Which baseball sort of over the decades has perfected, uh, still is relatively elusive. You know, even today, really, in pro basketball, um, you could argue that it's pretty solid in in hockey, but uh, it certainly, you know, eludes professional football, as we've talked about in a number of different uh, different episodes, right? So it's it's very interesting to see that even still today, albeit with the G League, right, which is, you know, an arm of the NBA, which is maybe overdue and maybe will go to different places given, you know, what's happening with college basketball. But, you know, around this time, 80s, 90s, even, you know, the years prior, uh, no real uh, alternative, shall we say, to the college game for any player, really, uh, aside from making the uh, uh, treacherous trek to somewhere in Europe and, and hoping. Uh, and even that was probably outside the spotlight of, of most NBA scouts anyway. Yeah, and it, yeah, Europe was not scouted uh, back then uh, to the extent that it is now. Uh, certainly the NBA is, you know, really is an international league uh, for all intents and purposes. And I think the thing that, is different today other than you've got, I think it's 20-some now, one-to-one affiliates where there's a G League team directly tied to an NBA team, you know, which obviously that was not the case in the CBA. Although here locally you've got the Pacers and they've got a G League team in Fort Wayne. Back then in the mid-'90s, what you don't have in the G League, the G League is primarily young players. It's, it's guys that are two or three years out of college at maximum. Um, you know, you would never see in the G League today something that you saw in the CBA where teams would have veteran guys that were in their 30s. Um, I can remember the first year that I was in Fort Wayne. I know we'll probably get into more detail in this in a, in a little while, but the first year that I was in Fort Wayne, we played uh, Rockford in the first round of the playoffs, and the the game began, and the two men in the jump circle were Greg Kite and Greg Dryling, who were both, you know, NBA journeymen that had played 10 plus years in the league and were in their mid thirties. You know, you would never see that kind of thing in the G League today. Well, I mean, I think I said this with David, right? So it sounds to me like it was a mixture of those on the way up and those on the way down. Is that a fair assessment or is that oversimplification? Well, no, I think that's correct. And I think that's where, that's where you get back to the, the comparison to AAA baseball. Um, you know, we've got a triple A baseball team here in Indianapolis and have for decades upon decades. And, you know, you can go to a triple A baseball game and, you know, any town in America that has a team and each roster will have two or three guys that are in their, you know, early to mid thirties that are just trying to hang on and get one last, you know, trip in the big leagues. Well, give me a sense of how you got on the radar of, of this team and the league, right? So I'm sure you're sending out tapes and, you know, making connections and hustling, so to speak. But, you know, how did you make those connections? How did it become a job and a gig and and, and beget all that stuff? And frankly, what did you th- expect or what were you thinking you were getting into? Well, it it really was a, a lot of, like like a lot of those situations come to be when you're just getting out of school. It, it, it It's what what you're able to do and, and, and what you know, but as much of circumstance and who you know. Uh, and it just so happened that um, my father knew someone who was a relative of the main owner of the team, uh, who was a guy from from north uh, from west west central Indiana. And uh, so I I phoned him and and talked to him about who I was and what I was hoping to do. And so he put me in touch with the general manager. So then I drove to Fort Wayne and, and, and met with him, and, and he was very clear that they already had a play-by-play guy, but they would they would like to have a regular analyst uh, for home games. And quite frankly, he hired me um, more or less on the basis that I had some experience calling games in college, but also that he and I had gone to the same school, albeit a couple decades apart. Um, so really the fact that you know he was an alum of the same school that I was really helped me get my foot in the door. And and I I drove back and forth between Indianapolis and Fort Wayne, which is about a two hour drive to do home games. Um, and then when they let the regular uh, the, the guy who had been the original voice of the team starting back uh, when the franchise began in 91. So he did the first four seasons um, or he did the first. Uh, yeah, he did the first 
first four and I did the last uh, five, when they let him go, or he went to Florida, I should say, to, to be with that team in Florida, um, I was the first person on their radar. I was the first person they called, and, and that was an easy an easy yes, and, and, I, and I was on my way. So your first couple of days there, it, walk us through sort of uh, your, uh, shall we say, your, your baptism by fire in terms of management, in terms of the team, in terms of travel. And I think like a lot of a lot of minor league situations, um, especially back then, um, and I and I know you've you've talked to guests in the past that, that have had similar stories. You know, um, you've got four or five people in the front office staff. And so everybody has to be able to do multiple jobs. And um, I think they were looking, they were, once they found out that I had uh, had some, some media relations in my background in college from working in at Syracuse, um, they were happy to have me on as a PR guy because I'm, that, that, you know, I'm able to do two jobs and really they paid me for one and a half. Um, so um, that was, you learn pretty quickly to be, uh, to be able to multitask and, and there was always something to do. And, but, you know, at that point you're young and, you know, I was 20, 25 when they hired me uh, single. And so, you know, and you're just, you're just so excited to be affiliated with uh, a pro sports team uh, that, you know, you kind of look past uh, the fact that you're not making much money. It's just kind of the excitement of, and every day is different. You just, from one day to the next, you just don't know. And then once the season starts, then it really gets crazy. So what, what was the, uh, uh, the, the level of play and, and the players and the sort of level of camaraderie? And frankly, what, did you, what was your take on, on management? Right? You were coming in, this is what, circa 91, 92? Well, the team came in in 90, the team, team's first season, the inaugural season for the franchise was 91, 92. And, and actually Gerald Oliver, who was a main character, I use that in quotes because it, it's a nonfiction book. A main character in David's book uh, with the Albany Patroons was our head coach back then. Then I came in in the, the summer of 95. So the 95, 96 season was my first. And as it turns out, coach Oliver was our assistant coach uh, that first season and or that first season that I was there. And then uh, the head coach was um, a gentleman named Bruce Stewart and he was let go right after new year's and they, um, they, they promoted Gerald to be the head coach and, and we just got red hot the last two months of the season and, uh, snuck into the playoffs in the last day of the year. So, but as far as the level of play goes, um, I was blown away. You know, I'd come from college and watching, you know, big East basketball, which was a pretty high level when I was at Syracuse. Um, but to watch the, you know, most teams in, in the, in, in the CBA and in, in those days in the mid nineties, most teams had, two or, you know, 10 man rosters. Most teams had two or three guys that had been in the ABA NBA already. Uh, and were probably on their way back at some point. And then they'd have another two or three guys that, that would end up there eventually. Uh, so it was, it was at a pretty high level. The Fort Wayne got a, a, a pretty decent reputation in a relatively short time of being a, a fairly solid franchise, which is saying something in the CBA. I suspect that by the time you got there, obviously, uh, what the ninety four ninety five season, right? Uh, the team had a, a losing record, but still made the postseason. You said as they squeaked in, right? So, uh, and I'm assuming that the well, you tell me what, what was the sort of embrace by by the city of Fort Wayne? You know, it's a relatively small market, so to speak. How well received uh, the local media, the fans? Uh, so the uh, Fort Wayne has, uh, from a sports standpoint, uh, Fort Wayne has three teams now. They had three. T- three different teams back then in terms of uh, you had the Fury. Now it's the G league team, but you had the CBA team. You had a single a baseball team uh, back then. They were called the wizards. Now they're called the 10 caps. And then you had the hockey team, the comets, and, and, it, and it really is a hockey town. Uh, the comets are one of the longest tenured franchises in minor league hockey that goes back to the early fifties. Well, absolutely. As a matter of fact, as growing up as a kid in Northern New Jersey, uh, listening to those games, on the uh, the big stick of uh, whoa whoa right uh, eleven ninety whoa whoa yeah we were on the sister station uh, which was um, thirteen eighty was the was the sister station with whoa whoa was the other AM that that. Um that that company owned. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Fort Wayne Fury Basketball here on Radio Hollywood 1380 WHWD. I'm Rob Brown, here to bring you all tonight's action as the Fury wrap up the regular season tonight against the Connecticut Pride, and the Fury 
in the driver's seat for the American Conference Championship as Fort Wayne needing just a point and a half in tonight's ball game with Connecticut. That's a quarter and a half won tonight to clinch the American Conference Championship outright. And Bob Chase was the voice of the Comets um, going back to 1952. And he was he was tremendous to me. You know, I could not believe well, I, I, he started in '53. Beg your pardon. So the, the franchise started in '52, and Bob started in '53, and did games up until he passed at the age of 90 in, in 2016. And he was a legend. I mean, he was and he was so gracious to me as a young kid that was not from there, uh, coming in to call games uh, for one of the pro franchises in town. Uh, he could not have been um, nicer to me. Um, and, and ironically, uh, I would Bob, uh, the only broadcaster who has called games longer for one team consecutive tenure is Vin Scully. Bob called games for the Comets for 63 years. Well, that's incredible uh, on a number of different fronts, including uh, the fact that, uh, you know, he stayed loyal and or local uh, to to that team versus, you know, for greener pastures, especially earlier in his career. Right. Yeah, he had he had plenty of opportunities. So so when the Fury first came in, they were really they were embraced, I think, pretty warmly by the by the community. Um, the first couple of years of the team, they were one of the top two or three teams in the league in attendance, and that was back when it was a 16 team league. Uh, even though the team had a losing record every year, by the time I got there in the summer of '95, um, that novelty had started to wear off. Uh, you know, you had you had four seasons by that point, all with losing records. And, you know, I was fortunate that I came in at the same time that the Fury signed Damon Bailey, who is legendary in this state for his play, both as a high school basketball star. I mean, he's the all-time leading scorer in Indiana high school basketball history. Then he played at Indiana. He was one of the, you know, one of the great players in Indiana University history. So he was, he's an icon. Uh, he's like on the Mount Rushmore of Indiana high school basketball. So with him coming into the franchise, that really gave the franchise a shot in the arm and kind of re-energized uh, the community's interest in the team. So you saw the attendance start to spike back up and, and we were back up in the top two or three in the league. Again. Right. So before that, though, I, 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 my initial impression was that you were kind of the, the second tenant, right? Oh, oh, yeah, we were always the second tenant, even when things were good. I, no question. Yeah. The Comets got most of the good dates because they were the primary tenant. And then, you know, by the time when the Fury came on the scene in 91, you know, the Comet, the Comet franchise was, was 39 years old at that point. So, yeah, we, we were absolutely the second tenant in the building. Well, speaking of that, let's let's talk about the building for a second, then we'll get into some of the seasons and the people and the personalities and stuff. But let, describe for our audience, for those who are not familiar with the Allen County War Memorial Coliseum. I think that's what it's called then, and now it's what it's, I think, still called, right? It, it, it's still, yes. I, I chuckle because I can still, it's one of those sensations that never leaves you. I can still imagine the stale popcorn smell out in the concourse that, that I think, has, even when they remodeled the building in the early 2000s and gave it a facelift, it, it, it didn't go away. Um, that building has so much history, and as a basketball fan, um, you know I grew up going to NBA games as a young kid, and 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 really got interested in the history of the game, the pro game especially. Um, so for me to uh, and we called the games, the basketball games, because it was the the Coliseum was first and foremost a hockey building. We called the basketball games from the hockey gondola in the ceiling. Um, which is a different perspective to call a game from than the normal courtside location that most pro broadcasters, at least back then, were used to calling the game from. Um, but that building um, was the original home of the Fort Wayne Pistons, who became the Detroit Pistons. Um, so that building was built for the Pistons and for the Comets. So it was it was a dual-purpose building when it was first constructed in the early 50s and um they hosted the 1953 nba all-star game in that building which was the last year uh that the nba played before the shot clock and i went back and looked it up 
there were 14 Hall of Famers that played in that game. Uh, and both the coaches in that game were, that were involved in that game are in the Hall of Fame. So that, that's – you think about Bill Char- – you know, Bill Sharman, Bob Cousy, George Mikan was the MVP of the game. And all of the seats in the lower deck were folding chairs so they could – change the, the arena over from hockey to basketball and back and forth. But all of the seats in the upper deck were wooden folding chairs, wooden, you know, bl- wooden seats. And those were the original seats. So you could go up there and sit, you know, buy a $5 ticket and sit up in the, in the second deck at a Fury game and be sitting in the same seat that somebody sat in when they sat there and watched the 1953 NBA all-star game. And to me that I thought that I always thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yet though a thirty-plus year gap, right, between top tier then NBA, right, and uh, so what was the what was the atmosphere then? It sounds like it was, um, I guess, by today's standards, a little uncomfortable, but maybe that wasn't the point of being there at games. You know, was it as rowdy as uh, as some of the Comets games I remember as a kid listening on the radio, or was it kind of a different sort of a sensibility, or was there cross pollination, frankly, amongst the fans? Between- well, I think there was a little bit of that, and like I said, with. Um- with with Damon Bailey and somebody with his popularity coming into the franchise, uh, that certainly drove up the volume of the crowds. And to make the you know, the arena, you know, when you're drawing five thousand people a night in a building that seats eighty five hundred, it's still not quite as full as you'd like it to be. So at at one point, um, we took to dropping a curtain down at one end. Uh, just beyond the baseline, to to you know section off, you know one oval, one end of the oval to make it a little more intimate, and that certainly helped in terms of uh, making the crowd a little more contained and and um, you know trapping the noise in a little bit and kind of ramping up the volume of things. So when you get there in in the ninety four ninety five season, that was the first season, correct? Ninety five ninety six. Ninety five ninety six. The amalgam of the team was what and whom, right? So if you could kind of outline it for our audience, you know, is it how many people were sort of, shall we say, on their way up and how many were kind of on the sort of on the down on the downslope? Uh, if you could kind of explain the composition a bit. Yeah. So so it's a lot like uh, that's another comparison, really, to AAA baseball and that you've got a lot of players coming and going um, throughout the course of the year. It's, it's a 56-game season, and um, the season started always two weeks after the NBA. So we would start in the middle of November, and the regular season would end at the end of, at the end of March, and then you'd have a month worth of playoffs, and the finals would be over by the end of April. So you know, typically in a 56-game season, you'd go through 25 guys typically, on a 10 man roster, um, there was always, uh, some flux and, you know, the team that you would have in early, you know, at the beginning of the season, wasn't the same team you'd have in January. And it wasn't the same team you'd have in March because guys would be coming and going, um, either going up to the NBA or you'd get guys that would realize that the NBA wasn't going to happen for them that particular year. So, um, at, at the middle of the season, you might have a guy just decide that, okay, I'm going to go to France and go play in France for a couple of months and make some money. Uh, so you always had to have some, some guys in your back pocket uh, that you could get in quickly to, to fill the roster spots. Well, at the same time, you also had uh, the 10-day contract thing, right, with the NBA looking for – for players to fill in gaps and that kind of stuff. And I, I so describe to me that sort of feeling, because I, I got to think that that is sort of a, it's a, it, as David Levine sort of mentioned before, it's sort of this, uh, I, you're kind of always on the edge, right? Because you get that call up, you get that 10 day trial. And if it goes well, maybe you stick, but more often than not, it probably doesn't happen. And then you're looking at coming back down again. And, you know, that's got to be a, uh, uh, you know, but Jen, you always have to be on call even when you're down because you could get that call again. I, that kind of existence and, and being an, a, a pro player and trying to be at uh, peak performance for any situation, plus the travel and all that stuff, which we'll get into. I don't know. It's got to be draining and or uh, a bit unnerving, frankly, to kind of focus and perform. No, and, uh, no question. And you'd see guys struggle with that, that, you know, a guy would get called up 
and it's happened it, it happened numerous times back then where a guy would get called up he'd have a 10 day and maybe he'd only get into one or two games and that might be four or five minutes total and that's not a lot to really show what you can do and so those guys come back and um there were times when and not just with our team but with but teams all across the league guys would come back and their attitude wouldn't be the same you know the 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 drive and the the focus that they had that got them a call up in the first place you know wasn't it maybe necessarily wasn't there when they came back um so it's a tough it was a tough deal to watch guys kind of fight through that and that was the one thing that that I was um especially when I went on to work in the NBA for a little while, that was the thing that I always told people about what it was like to work in the CBA. You, you had, and I think, I think David's book really uh, captures this um, when you're somebody that works for the team. Um, you really get to, especially if, if guys are there more than a couple of weeks, not the guys that are there for two games and leave, but the guys that are there most of the season, you really develop a relationship with them because you have two things in common. One, nobody's making any money. And two, nobody wants to be there. They all want to be in the NBA. So you start with those two things as a commonality, and it's, and it's much easier to develop relationships. And when you develop a relationship, you really get invested, and, and you want to see guys succeed. And, that's, and from a staffer standpoint, the way I was you know, coming from my, my perspective, uh, the call-ups were – they were good and bad and that you were, when a guy got called up, you were really happy for the guy and you hoped, Hey, I hope this is a good opportunity for you. But at the same time, as they were leaving, you knew that, Oh boy, we're going to have to scramble to fill, to replace, you know, this guy's 18 points a game or his 10 rebounds a game. And what are we going to do? We still have to play and try and win games. Well, how about as a broadcaster, that's got to be a bit unnerving for you too, because it, it seems to me that every day, uh, you're, you know, uh, proverbially uh, ripping up the, the media guide and probably, you know, uh, uh, panning or penciling in lots of different names and changes and, and all those kinds of things. I, it probably was n- never the same day twice during the season, especially. No, 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 no question. And I learned not I learned not to uh, not to preprint my my score sheets before the game. I always wrote them in in pencil because you just never knew um, I the countless times especially when we were on the road where you would hope that the fax machine at the, at the hotel was working because somebody from the office was going to fax you over the signature pages to the contract. And then you had to go to the guy's room and get his signature and fax it to the league and get him approved and on the roster in time for a game that starts in five hours. I mean, that happened, that happened numerous times um, to try and, you know, fill in for somebody that had just left and, and make sure that you were taking the floor with with the full 10 guys. Well, describe that first season to me uh, in terms of some of the players and um, and the situation, because uh, you came kind of at the right time, at least as the from the first number of seasons in Fort Wayne. I mean, the Fury had a very interesting season that year. I would argue they didn't kind of really start all that the great, but they certainly did finish very strong and almost uh, to the ultimate uh, conclusion. Well, and it was it was really a case of what I said uh, about there's different teams that you have during the year. The team you have in early November isn't the team you have in January, isn't the team you have in March. And um, the franchise made a coaching change and, and hired Jared, Gerald Oliver, uh, promoted him from being an assistant coach. And, and he really was a CBA lifer in terms of, you know, he spent some time in the college game. He was an assistant coach at Tennessee and helped recruit Ernie Grunfeld and Bernard King. Uh, he had been an assistant coach at Marquette right after Al McGuire had retired. Uh, but his his real um, resume, his he made his bones, as you say, as they say, um, in the CBA. Uh, so he knew how to get players. He knew how to get the best out of guys that maybe necessarily didn't want to be there. And and we were fortunate, and we made a couple of trades. Um, the um, the San Diego team folded right after New Year's. And um, we, uh, our GM made a great trade and, and picked up their best player, arguably a guy named Everett Gray, who was the sixth man on the UNLV team that lost to Duke in the 91 Final Four. Um, so we picked him up right after New Year's. 
Jaron Jackson, who played at Georgetown and uh, had a long NBA career. Uh, we picked him up uh, right after that. A lot of your listeners might know his son, Jaron Jackson Jr., who plays for the Grizzlies. <laughs> uh, was the third pick in the draft last year. Those two guys were kind of missing pieces and, and fit in around you know, Damon Bailey and um, a guy named Eric Anderson who played Indiana University, who was a really good kind of uh, jump shooting forward. Uh, Carl Thomas, who was um, an excellent, one of the best three-point shooters in uh, league history, played Eastern Michigan, had a cup of coffee with the Cavaliers. Um, Dwayne Cooper was our other point guard. He played at USC with Harold Miner uh, and played for the Lakers uh, a little bit in the early 90s. Um, then I mentioned uh, Greg Kite, you know, who was uh, Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish's backup with the Celtics all those years ago in the mid-80s. Um, played on those teams that went to the finals. And um, and then a guy named Clinton Smith, who was also in uh, that uh, David's book about the Patroons. Um, and Clinton was kind of the prototypical CBA player in that um, he didn't have a, the skill set that was going to put him in the league and keep him there. Uh, but he was a guy that could play four positions on offense and guard four positions on defense. And he was um, happy uh, to be in the league and, and, and to, to be a part of the team. And so those are every team needs in the CBA. You always look at teams that are successful, have one or two of those guys that are kind of glue guys that, you know, that, that recognize that maybe they're kind of in between CBA and the NBA um, and, and never going to get there and stick, but, but can make a good living and, and um, certainly impact the outcome of games um, when they're in the CBA. Well, you also mentioned uh, the coach, Gerald Oliver. I mean, I think this also it applies there too, right? Because this is a guy you kind of basically said he's a lifer. You know, he kind of understands the CBA system, right? And all its, shall we say, idiosyncrasies. And, 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 and Oliver was actually, if I'm not mistaken, was returning because wasn't he the original coach when the Fury got He to- was. So and, and and obviously, you know, his arrival, certainly uh, among other things, as you're hinting at, uh, certainly sort of uh, turned sort of the team around. But I it's just it, and I guess I guess that also applies, uh, you know, a, across the league. Right. It's sort of this, you know, kind of changing brew, if you will, uh, for each team of veterans and the ups and downs, the call ups, the, uh, the the send downs. Uh, and uh, frankly, hoping that uh, a coach who has uh, motivated himself enough uh, and maybe knows a little bit of the tricks of the trade of the league versus that, say, of of the NBA or the college game, uh, that, you know, uh, we saw the George Carl conversation, right? You know, uh, it, it does all matter, right? Because the right kind of motivational coach who understands the position in which everybody's in, uh, mixed with hopefully some decent streaks of talent, and frankly, just a little bit of, of to the extent that that can be controlled, which it probably couldn't, you know, consistency, right, day to day or week to week. So at least you've got a roster that people can get familiar with each other versus it being a complete revolving door every single day. Oh, yeah, no question. And, and Gerald, with him knowing the league like he did, he knew who, who the guys were that could impact winning in the CBA, um, Jaron Jackson, I mentioned earlier, was a perfect example. Jaron was at a point in his career uh, in the mid-90s where he was kind of back and forth between the NBA and the CBA. Uh, and he eventually found a home in San Antonio and, and, and was uh, a key bench guy for their first championship team in 99 and uh, earned a ring with uh, Tim Duncan and, and David, uh, David Robinson. But but Jaron was a guy that when Jaron was in the league, his teams always went to the finals, and and that wasn't a, that wasn't a coincidence. So Gerald identified that Jaron was going to be available, and so he made that trade for him. Um, and and that's just one example. But Gerald knew who those guys were, and he knew that if if there was a guy out there like Jaron who similarly impacted winning the CBA, and maybe that guy was coming back from a stint playing in Belgium, and you know, a team, you know, Grand Rapids, for example, had their rights. He would trade for that guy's rights, knowing that he was coming back in two weeks. And then when the guy arrives, oh, all of a sudden he's he's on our roster and he's impacting the game. He he was always, from a personnel standpoint, he was always one or two moves ahead of everybody else in that regard. So explain the playoffs to me, maybe that final series and uh, just how close uh, the Fury got to uh, winning it all that season. Oh, my. Well, um, 
I think you have to go back. At, uh, initially, you have to go back to the end of the regular season. Um, you know, we were we were not tracking that we were going to be in the playoffs, and um, I think uh, this this bears repeating in case uh, people aren't aware. Back then, uh, in the CBA, the standings were dictated by points. So you you won a you 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 earned a point for every quarter that that you won, and then three points for winning the game. So there were seven points at stake each night. So it was a 56 game season, so it all evened out in the end. But in order to figure out which team was in first and second and so forth during the course of the season, when teams had not played an equal number of games, they would divide the total points into total games, and you get an average, and that would kind of dictate the order of the standings. Um, but we were struggling. We had lost three in a row, and we only had five games to go, and uh, it didn't look good. And I remember Jaron Jackson had been in Houston. He had played, been with us. He got called up, and then Houston let him go. Um, and so he came back, and I remember he came to practice, and he asked me, he said, what do we need to do to make the playoffs? I said, well, we have five games left, and we have to win them all, and we have to win probably most every quarter uh, in addition to that. And he said, well, let's do it. He said, I, and, and I'll never forget it. At the end of practice, he called the, he called the guys together and he said, he made the comment that he hadn't, he didn't come back to Fort Wayne just to play five games and go home. Um, if he, you know, he came back with the expectation that we were going to make the playoffs and make a run. And so not only did we win the last five games of the season, we won 31 and a half out of the final 35 points. So think about that. We only lost three quarters of the final 15 and tied another one and had to win the fourth quarter of the last game to get into the playoffs by one point. We didn't have the tiebreaker against Chicago. Yeah. See that. See that's interesting because uh, in, it, it's it's obviously different in the in the sort of quarter by quarter system. I mean, you're literally looking at those last five games really as five times four, right? 20 different sort of individual games, right? And you, you literally, you know, if you can get the mindset straight, right? You're literally trying to do it block by block and winning truly each quarter, like it's piece by piece versus trying to focus on the the the, the mountain at hand to win five games, quote unquote, in a row. And that was how close we came to not making the playoffs. Uh, but that was also then the kind of momentum that we took into the playoffs. And we played Rockford in the first round and, and beat them three games to one. Um, obviously, we were the last team in, so we didn't have home court in any series. Um, and Rockford had had our number most of the season, but we played well. Then we played Quad City in the conference finals, um, and that was that was a crazy series because Quad City, I think they were twenty three and five or twenty four and four at home. They were they were a phenomenal home team. Uh, they had a really good coach and a guy named Dan Panaggio, who was a CBA veteran. Uh, and we actually went on the road and won game two. So we came back to Fort Wayne with the series tied 1-1, won game three. And now we're in a position where one went away from going to the CBA finals. And, you know, just a month ago, it looked like our season was going to be over. Um, and that was the game, that game four in Fort Wayne, that was the game where right before the game started, the mascot fell from the ceiling. All right, hang in there, everybody. We're going to be back to our conversation in just a second, but uh, time quickly to pay a couple of bills. And uh, you've heard me talk about The Great Courses Plus on uh, some previous episodes. And if you haven't tried it, well, by golly, this is uh, one of your last opportunities to get a free month of unlimited video learning with the world's greatest professors when you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash goodseats. You're going to get a free month of unlimited access to the entire library of thousands of hours of great lectures and tons of great coursework uh, from The Great Courses Plus. Look, you, you're interested in things like sports psychology. Uh, you ever wonder if there's life on Mars? You want to learn how to invest or, or possibly uh, uh, improve your uh, your muscle tonage with uh, strength training? Well, there's a whole bunch of those kind of courses and more across topics like history and science and food and wine and various hobbies, health and fitness personal and professional development, you name it. And I, I highly recommend their brand new course uh, made uh, or put together in conjunction with uh, National Geographic uh, called Fundamentals of Photography. 
Yeah, you kids today, you think with your uh, your uh, smartphones, you think you can kind of handle everything. Yeah, I got all kinds of filters and lenses and stuff, and, and you've got it all covered, right? Well, no, no, you don't, Einstein. You've got lots of uh, amazing uh, technical capabilities that only a professional photographer uh, and one you can learn from uh, at The Great Courses Plus can teach you. Uh, things like aperture and 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 lens uh, sizes and, and uh, things like uh, shutter speeds and and. You know, there's all kinds of stuff and there's different ways to shoot stuff, whether it's digital or, God forbid, even use film for that sort of high quality, uh, uh, you know, sort of retro look. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that you uh, you young whippersnappers have no idea. And I highly encourage you to check out Fundamentals of Photography among the dozens and dozens of other great courses and hundreds and thousands of hours of great learning that will be yours, all yours, at The Great Courses Plus. And again, that's The Great Courses Plus dot com slash good seats and you will get one free month of unlimited yes i said unlimited access to the entire library of the great courses plus service and and uh, and offerings it's a tremendous opportunity there's so many great things in there and uh, i guarantee that uh, a month will not be enough and you will be converted like i am and have been to the great stuff that is the great courses plus once again the great courses plus.com slash good seats for a limited time offer of a free month of the entire service unlimited access uh, you get the app you can stream it to any device you can download them you can listen to them in audio form it's all there for you once again at the great courses plus.com slash good seats get your free month enjoy it let me know how you love it because i guarantee you will and now, back to our conversation. So uh, let's let's pause there and let's uh, let's go through that story because that obviously uh, gained some national attention and not for sort of the best reasons. But sort of what happened during that game that uh, garnered national attention, maybe for the not for the not for the most positive of uh, of reasons. Well, as was the case, and I think in a lot of arenas back then, certainly in the NBA, you would have mascots repelled down for the ceiling during the starting lineups, and and so we had the same thing um, uh, in our building throughout that year. The mascot was Saber, was the name of the mascot, the Saber Tooth Tiger. Uh, Tim De Leon was the was the guy in the suit, and uh, he was coming down from the ceiling, and as he was repelling down. He came down about the first fifth, about 15 feet into the descent, uh, his clip broke. And so he began free falling down the rope, but, but there's nothing to stop him because the clip is now open. And, um, somehow, some way about 15 feet or so before he hit the floor, the clip re-engaged and grabbed the rope. So that then now all of a sudden he's back engaged to the rope but his momentum of falling in the interim uh, takes him to the floor. So he hits the floor, even though the rope is designed to stop about five feet from, from the floor. He hits the floor because his momentum takes him there and he breaks his back. Well, when he hits the floor, though, the rope then gets taut and lifts him back up another 15 feet and begins to slam him back down again. Uh, fortunately, uh, the guy... Uh, his name, is, his name is Greg Holton, who was the Comets mascot. He was there in, in civilian clothes. He wasn't in mascot outfit, but he was in civilian clothes at the bottom of the rope to spot Tim. He then, when Tim began to fell a second time, he caught him and laid him down onto the concrete because he fell just off the edge of the, of the court. Um, and he broke his back on the first fall. Uh, and they, and by all indications, they said that the, the thing that kept him from being paralyzed was that the fact that the head of the mascot suit was so bulky and enormous, uh, it stabilized his shoulders and neck, um, kind of like what race car drivers have, that device that keeps their head uh, stabilized. And so fortunately, that, that, was, um, that, that kept it from being much more serious than it, than it certainly could have been. I, I, I'm assuming he recovered to, to some extent or hopefully altogether? He did. And I was reading, so I, I was reading an AP article about this, and um, I, it implies uh, that uh, a, a doctor of orthopedics who happened to be, was at the game, I think, who 
least he was. Mm -hmm. Yep. He was sitting on the baseline and seated about 10 feet away. Yeah, but now he was. I guess I don't know if he was in an official capacity, but it, it, the article slate stated that he go to he went to all the games and stuff. So I, I guess that that also probably helped too to have the proverbial doctor in the house too. Yeah, he was. They were on the scene within seconds. Um, you know, he was one of our team doctors, and he he was in the arena that night. He he was he or one of his partners was at every game. Um, so that certainly helped things, and you know that was twenty plus years ago. My recollection. Um, is that that, uh, that that Tim was out of the hospital fairly quickly, though. Okay, so before we – and I, the, there's a game that the, the, the Fury lost and it tied the series and, and it went sent to Quad City. To, this was the uh, semifinal uh, round, I guess. How was you – as a broadcaster, how do you how, – how are you handling that on the air? I was pretty shaken up uh, because I was doing the games from the hockey gondola. So he fell right by – he fell right by me. Like he came down as he, as he began to fall coming down the rope, he was probably 30 feet away from me, maybe 40 feet away. Um, so I tracked it, tracked him all the way down. Now we had the lights dimmed and the spotlight was on him. And thankfully the, uh, the gentleman that was running the spotlight saw what was happening fairly quickly and cut the light. So, um, to um, lessen the attention of it a little bit. But um, yeah, as I recall, there was about a half an hour delay. Um, the assistant commissioner was actually at the game for the, 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 for the league. Uh, so there was a, a lot of discussion as to whether or not we were even going to play the game. Uh, they made the decision to go ahead and play. And then we lost, uh, lost the game by five uh, and then came back and went on the road and, and won the uh, won the, the deciding game five on the road a couple of days later in Quad City. Um, and I remember when we, when we, the bus pulled up to the arena in Quad City right there, it's in Moline, it's right on the, the Mississippi River. Um, Jaron uh, Jackson got up and uh, gave uh, a very brief but impassioned speech about winning one for the cat. <laughs> um, yeah, the, you know, Tim, uh, who was still in the hospital at that point, and, uh, uh, the guys went out and, pl and played played really really well. And how how about that final series then? I mean, was it uh, you know close? Did you really tantalizingly think it was going to happen, or was it uh, uh, maybe you can walk our audience through sort of that too? Yeah. So so we played Sioux Falls uh, in that final, and and um, you know because we were the last team in, they had uh, they had the home court, so it went uh, two three two. So the first two games were in Sioux Falls, and. Um, we actually played pretty well. We got a split. We won the second game. Um, I think, uh, I think it was broken after that, but, but we had, I think 18 three pointers in the second game. That was a finals record at that point. Uh, that was well before that was long before the three point shot became in, in pro ball, you know, as prevalent as it is now. Um, and then we went back to Fort Wayne and I think we felt pretty good because, you know, it was one, one, we had the next three games in our building and, um, Lost game three by six, let a lead get away in the fourth. Um, lost the third, the fourth game in double overtime, um, and then lost the fifth game at the buzzer. So, you know, we lost, we lose the series four games to one, um, but you know, very easily uh, all three of those games that we lost at home, we, we were outplayed pretty solidly in the first game in Sioux Falls. But the three games we lost at home, you know, very easily could have gone in our way, but but they didn't. Not bad for a first season, right? I mean, at almost the championship. No, I, it was. I I couldn't believe it. The, you know, my first year with the team, and we go to the finals, and I'm thinking, you know, every year is going to be like this, and I was mistaken, uh, obviously. But um, but yeah, it was a great, and, and it was a great. It was great to see, you know, how the town really embraced that that group of guys, that final month of the season and through the playoffs. That those two months. Um, there in March and April uh, were one of the most exciting times uh, for me in, in my time in uh, in broadcasting, being around a team. Um, you know, I think we only lost maybe one home game in that whole stretch. Um, and Gerald took to wearing um, he had this um, he had this teal sport coat that was one of the ugliest things you've ever seen, and he wore it one night. Uh, right after he got the job in January and we won at home and that got, and it got to be, he would wear that coat every game we played at home. 
And I think at one stretch um, in that run to the playoffs, I think we won 13 in a row at home at one point. Uh, and that's hard to do in the CBA when your roster's turning over. Um, and so, yeah, he coined this – Memorial Magic was the phrase that he coined uh, around that team that got hot. And, you know, there were some T-shirts around town that had that phrase on it. And uh, it was it was just – it was a really fun time and a fun team to be around. All right, let me let me ask you about a couple of names that uh, are uh, – even some of the casual fans would probably know and, uh, and maybe uh, connect with – uh, the Fury franchise. One is Keith Smart, who came in the next year uh, as a player and then uh, went on to, uh, I don't know if it was that season or the season after, to become, I don't think he was a player coach, but he became a coach coach, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Keith Keith was the hero of the, the 1987 NCAA final when he hit the jump shot for Indiana to beat Syracuse. So he's uh, he, he's always, uh, is and will be beloved in this in this state for his heroics as a Hoosier. So he came to Fort Wayne, like you said, that next season in 96, 97, that was his last season as a player. Um, He had played uh, in overseas. Some he had played in the CBA uh, primarily in rapid city um, for Eric Musselman, who's now the coach collegiately at Arkansas, but had a great run at Nevada um, in the last couple of years. Um, Eric Musman was his coach in Rapid City, and then that franchise moved to West Palm Beach, Florida. So Keith played with them down in Florida for a year, and then he came to us and uh, played for a season and then retired. Uh, He was 32 at that point. And then that summer, that summer of 97, he had an opportunity to either – we offered him the head coaching job uh, uh, just as the coach, not as a player coach, but just as the head coach. And he was also had an opportunity to be an assistant coach at Indiana University for Bob Knight. And that, I know, had some appeal for him because uh, Keith met his wife at Indiana. Uh, his, his wife was from Bloomington. Uh, her, her, uh, his father-in-law was the head, I believe, of the law school uh, at IU for, some, for a while. But uh, I remember him telling me that Coach Knight gave him the advice that if you have an opportunity to be a head coach, If your choices are to be a head coach or be an assistant coach, regardless of the opportunity of the head coach, you take that job. If you have an opportunity to be in charge, that's the opportunity you take. And so he did, and and he he took to it right away. That first year um, with Keith as our head coach in 97-98 was the best year the franchise had, um, certainly from a win-loss standpoint. It went 31-25, and and won the conference regular season title. Stokes got the rebound. He'll give it to Kim Brown. He'll load up a three left side. In and out. It was in the bottom. And now Brown picks it up, and that'll do it. Buzzer sounds. And the Fury with the win, 116-103. to They win the quarter 30-25, and the Fury with the win at five standings points tonight are the regular season American Conference champions, the Fury's first conference and division championship in team history. And he was kind of on his way as a head coach, and um, that continues to this day in coaching uh, in terms of being in the NBA. You know, he's been a head coach in the NBA three different times and uh, been an assistant coach in a couple of different places, and currently he's in about to start his second season uh, as the lead assistant with the Knicks. Well, yeah, and, and obviously uh, somebody that is a quintessential uh, uh, coach and, and has uh, you know a lot of chops, uh, and and it's 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 fascinating. Probably you had a ringside seat to sort of see the earliest days of that coach, right? Sort of the germination and, and sort of uh, the foundation, I guess, laid for uh, what ultimately became an NBA career uh, in the coaching ranks. It's uh, it's probably it's, and I guess that's a little bit of of the of the fun to see, not just only of a player who you know goes on to make good on a different level, but also coaches and, and uh, maybe to some extent, even referees and and other fellow broadcasters for that matter. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, Keith, uh, all my time in pro basketball, Keith was one of the most genuine people I've, I've ever met. Um, He's, he's just an incredible person. Um, We had a chance to catch up when the Knicks were in town uh, last season playing the Pacers. And uh, we we were talking about, uh, the fact that there were only two people that saw in um, in person Keith's first win as a as a head coach. So that was the we opened Keith's first year as the coach in Fort Wayne. Uh, there was an expansion team in Idaho in Boise, 
And we so we opened the season out there. We played two games, uh, lost the first game, won the second game um, in the final seconds. Uh, and I was there uh, as a broadcaster. And then um, Keith's first win as an NBA coach, uh, he was in Cleveland as an assistant, and John Lucas was let go in January. And that was when the Cavs were um, – um, I'm not going to use the T word, but let's just say they were positioning themselves to try and get LeBron in the draft. Uh, so that roster was less than desirable. Uh, but I was working for the Clippers at that point and was on the road trip as a member of the PR department. And we went to Cleveland and, and, and they won the Cavs won that night. And that was Keith's first win as an NBA coach. And so the only people that were in the building for both of those games were myself and a guy by the name of Clifford Ray, who was an assistant for us in Fort Wayne and was an assistant on the bench with Keith in Cleveland. And, and Cliff is probably best known as um, the starting center for the mid seventies warriors when they won the NBA title in 75. And then um, his work with uh, doc rivers and the big men uh, with the Celtics here about a decade ago, going from one extreme, maybe to the other, let's talk about the other sort of name uh, associated with the Fort Wayne uh, fury. And that's Percy Miller, uh, uh, better known as master P Explain this story to me. Obviously, a known rapper, uh, quite successful, but I guess in many respects, again, looking backward, and I was not there at the time, you know, public relations, uh, either boon or nightmare, I guess, depending on your perspective, right? Spotlight coming to coming to town. Well, what was that story all about? And what about his play on the, on the court? Because it didn't look like he got a whole lot of game time. Well, he had uh, he had played in high school in New Orleans. Um, and had played, I'm not sure if he, he actually played on the team, but, but I know he was on the roster at the university of Houston, um, after, uh, his high school days. Um, but the connection there was, um, uh, Keith Smart was our head coach at the time. So this would have been, um, in the lead up to the 98, 99 season, Keith was our head coach. That was his second year, uh, as our coach, um, and Keith is from Baton Rouge. And so someone that Keith had known um, put, uh, got in touch uh, regarding Master P and to see if we had any interest in bringing him in. Uh, so that's, that, that, that New Orleans-Baton Rouge connection was really what opened the door. And, and Master P had actually been in training camp in um, 98 with um, the Charlotte Hornets and had been let go. So he had been in an NBA camp um, just a couple uh, weeks earlier. And so he comes in uh, right after the season starts, maybe the week before Thanksgiving. Maybe the season was a week old, so it was a week before Thanksgiving. And uh, he was with us for about uh, probably about three weeks. I think he played in eight games. Um, I, I couldn't remember, so I looked it up. He, the, most, the most he played in a single game was 13 minutes. Um, and I'd say he was okay. Um, you could see that he had some skills, but, uh, he was not certainly not an NBA caliber player. Um, and he's, and, um, he, he certainly brought us attention and, and brought some media outlets around our games and practices that normally would not have paid us any attention or, or even known, uh, that we existed. So that was, uh, that certainly was interesting, but, uh, as far as in between the lines, you know, what he brought, and I always wondered what he could have done because he had so many business interests and other things going. Um, I would imagine that however many times we practiced in the three weeks that he was on the roster, uh, you know, and NBA teams don't, I mean, professional teams in general don't practice every day because of the travel and the games, but, but I would imagine, uh, if he was at if if he was at half the practices, that would be generous. I'm not sure he was even at half of them. So I was wondered what he what he could have become if if that was the only thing he did for a period of time. He might have gotten a little further than than he did. Well, how, how, truly, how much was of this was public relations? Right, uh, didn't hurt, I guess. Right, but could be a distraction to quality on the on the court. No, I, I don't think uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. Looking back, it wasn't that much of a distraction. Um, but I don't think – I think it was a public relations um, – it was a positive, but only after the fact in that I don't think if there wasn't that initial 
Louisiana connection between Master P and his people and and Keith, um, and that that door had never been opened, I don't think we would have opted to to go down that road. If he had called us unsolicited and wanted to come play, I'm not sure that would have that would have happened. Well, he was quite the entertainment uh, sort of entrepreneur. He had a lot of different sort of uh, hands in, in different things. And, and and around that time, I mean, he was like he was in the top echelon of of highest paid. Uh, entertainer. Oh, he was he was huge. He was huge back then. And I remember we went on a road trip Thanksgiving weekend. We went to uh, we went to Boise and went to Sioux Falls, and it was a back to back. So we we actually flew on Thanksgiving. If you had told me when I took the job in '95 that three years later I would be eating Thanksgiving dinner at the Double Tree in Boise with Master P, I would have given you a sideways look. Um, but that's, but that's what happened. And, uh, we played, um, Idaho the next night and then went to Sioux Falls, uh, the night after that. And, and he played in, I remember he played in both of those games, but he traveled with, you know, we didn't, clearly we didn't travel with security. It was just the 10 players, the two coaches, the trainer and myself. So we had a traveling party of 14. Um, but when, when, when P traveled with us, it was, um, 10 players, two coaches, trainer, myself, and three security guys. Um, so that was a little different, uh, you know, traveling with, we were the only NBA team that traveled with security or the only CBA team that traveled with security guys. And I remember going back to the hotel because, you know, we didn't fly charters. We flew commercial when we flew. So you were always on the 6 a.m. flight to give yourself the best opportunity to get to where you wanted to get to if you had travel uh, weather delays during the day. So we had a 6 a.m. flight the next morning. So you would cross your fingers that there'd be a place open to eat. And it just so happened that uh, the, the hotel in Sioux Falls was one of the nicer hotels in the league. It was a Sheraton that was actually attached to the arena. Um, and they had you know, a restaurant there in the hotel that stayed open. And I remember one of, one of P's bodyguards who I never knew what any of their real names were. They all went by nicknames. This guy's name was Gumbo. Um, he was probably six, three, about three and a quarter, three fifty. I remember he came in and he ordered the entire left side of the menu as a wind down after the game <laughs> and myself and, and our assistant coach, Kent Davison, just sitting there shaking our heads. Just, just another day in the CBA where you just, you never know what you're going to see from one day to the next. So I, it's interesting given all his uh, interests and obviously basketball being part of his, uh, his background as well. Why th- playing versus say maybe investing or, or buying a team or getting involved in the NBA and, you know, more business-like stuff. I wonder. I think he still had the dream. Um, I think he still had the dream of playing at the highest level. Um, and, and maybe, maybe an indication of that is after he came and played with us and, you know, like I said, it was an eight game stint. Um, he was gone for good, probably by the middle of December. Um, he went back to training camp the next year um, in 1999 with uh, Toronto. Uh, so, you know, he was still still trying to make it. So I, I think he legitimately thought that he had a chance uh, to play in the NBA and, and uh, certainly at that point uh, wasn't willing to give up on that. Very interesting. All right. Well, let me ask you about one other sort of last name that uh, uh, is is not specifically endemic to the Fury, but certainly to the league itself. Uh, and since you were there during uh, and then ultimately after its demise or in the midst of, uh, that's Isaiah Thomas. Uh, maybe our first sort of real uh, viewpoint about what the hell happened to the CBA uh, in its final uh, months and year. Um, from your perspective as an employee of the Fort Wayne Fury? So Isaiah's, uh, the, the first year that Isaiah owned the league was my last year in Fort Wayne. So we, we crisscrossed there for a year. He, he bought the league in October of 99. Um, most, the average, the average salary, or the max, excuse me, the average salary was, is, no, it was the average. The average salary was about $1,500 a week. Rookies made a little bit less than that. Um, there were a handful of guys. Um, if a guy had NBA experience, or maybe if he was a guy like Damon Bailey, who had marketing, you know, marketing value and box office value in his market, 
Um, guys would make more than that. Um, but when Isaiah came in, he cut the maximum uh, per week salary to a thousand dollars, and um, capped out rookies at eight hundred a week. Um, and then looking back, that was that was a, I'm sure from a player's perspective it wasn't, but that was a good thing for the league in that it forced the league to be younger. And that that year, that ninety nine two thousand season, the league in terms of the lack of veteran guys and more rookies and guys one or two years out of college, the league looked a lot more like the G League looks now in that regard. You didn't have guys like Greg Kite I mentioned earlier. You didn't have guys that had been in the NBA seven or eight years that were trying to get one last contract. Um, so those guys were kind of forced out of the league because of that that cut. Um, so from that that regard, it was a good thing. He, he put a dress code in. Um, that, that I thought that was good, um, required, um, people to wear, cause we flew commercial. So we were pretty visible walking through airports and required, you know, people to wear a collared shirt and, you know, walk in with a, you know, a coat on if you had one, uh, those sorts of things. But, um, but the league was progressing. And then, you know, there was a rumor that the NBA was starting to think about putting this, a development elite together of their own, but, but they, um, you know, it was reported. I don't know if it was true or not. I wasn't involved in the meeting, certainly. But um, it was reported that the NBA offered him $11 million plus, um, plus a share of the profits to buy the CBA from him. So they would use that framework as the, the foundation of the, the developmental league that they were building. And by that point, you know, when I came into the CBA – when I came in, when the Fury came in, let's let's go back to that. When the Fury came in in 91, 92, the CBA was a 17 team league. Um, when Isaiah bought it, it was down to it was down to nine. So clearly things were tracking downward. Um, so they offered them supposedly they offered him 11 million for the nine teams, and uh, he turned that down. And then in uh, June of 2000, he took. Uh, he accepted the Pacer job as their head coach. Well, um, league rules prohibit, NBA rules prohibit uh, league personnel from owning minor league franchises. So he had to put the league in a blind trust. And then right after that, the NBA announced they were forming their own league. So that pretty much eliminates the NBA as a buyer. And, uh, you know, the blind trust tries to sell the league – you can uh, speculate as to how aggressively they tried to, but they tried to find it, a seller, a buyer, excuse me, and uh, eventually gives up and suspends play in early February of 01, and then the league goes bankrupt two weeks later. So, um, you know, the league was 53 years old when Isaiah bought it, and from the time that he bought it to the time it went bankrupt, that was 18 months. Yeah, and I realize that you were sort of uh, kind of already, you know, split the scene by then. And I'm sure I know that there are other angles to the story and a lot of other sort of, uh, shall we say, perspectives. But I, it does to the outside viewpoint. And I have not done enough thorough investigation. But in some respects, you could also sort of see that rebuff of Thomas by the uh, of the NBA's offer, right? It's you know, bought it for 10 million, sell it for 11 plus. Uh, you know, it's not much of an investment, but, you know, it's only nine months that he owned the owned the, the league and made it a, a single entity. But then, you know, by taking that Pacers job, uh, you, the conspiracy theorist out there would probably say, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe that was a little uh, uh, bait to kind of, you know, finally take him out of the whole mix. And then it would allow the NBA sort of unfettered access to kind of, you know, build their own thing on their own, given that uh, he wasn't going to sell. Ooh, that's, I've never heard that one. That's an interesting angle. Uh, I'd never heard that before. That's Hey, I'm not saying it's true, and I'm not saying I know where that sort of came from, but I, I just, it, you know, I, certainly in the mixing bowl, but I mean, I just, it just, uh, it just seems that, uh, I don't know, that the NBA clearly had uh, designs, and, um, you know, there were a couple of different ways to achieve it, and I guess if they, plan A didn't work, then, you know, it's probably a plan B or C. Well, I think I always got the perception, and again, this is just my opinion, I'm glad you, you couched what we're talking about there with, with qualifiers uh, that this is just my, my perspective and there are many others. Um, I always got the impression that he had a vision long-term for what he wanted to do with it, the, it being the CBA. 
whether that's good or bad, right or wrong, that's not for me to say. Uh, and maybe he looked at it the same way somebody would look at they were flipping a house. You know, they buy a house at low value, they fix it up, and they sell it for a profit. Maybe that was his approach. Um, but I think as much as maybe he was interested in taking that, seeing where he could take that, I think the opportunity to get back into the game and be on the sideline and be involved in day-to-day competition. Um, what I know about him in talking to people about him, people that know him well, that's the thing that drives him. And I think um, when he was presented with that opportunity, that competitive instinct in him kicked in and that was something that was way too important to him to pass up. And then I think he just, you know, at that point, what happened to the CBA it, it was was irrelevant to him. Yeah, so you, you left in 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 ninety nine. Uh, yeah, summer, uh, spring of uh, March of two thousand for greener pastures. So I, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went to work for the Clippers in Los Angeles in the in the PR department. Another thing that he did, he turned the he turned the playoffs into single game single elimination playoffs. So it was like a NCAA tournament. So it was a bracket one game, which was a travel nightmare trying to get from one place to the next. Cause um, so, so I did, we were knocked out in the first round and um, just to kind of bring the CBA story to a loop, uh, to a close for me personally. Um, so my last game as a CBA employee um, we play in Rockford in the single elimination playoffs. We get beat. We, we kick away a lead down the stretch. And, um, and I've already taken the Clipper job at that point. So I know that I'm leaving. I know that I have a job lined up and I know that, um, I'm going on to the NBA and I have a, a, a sick feeling in my stomach that the CBA is, uh, sinking and that, um, some of my friends and, and my coworkers are, are, are going to be out of work in sooner rather than later. And that, that instinct turned out to be correct. Um, but as the, we, were, we were on the bus in Rockford, getting ready to head back to Fort Wayne, that's about a four-hour ride. And, and as the bus is in the left turn lane, getting ready to turn onto the highway, the transmission drops out of the bottom of the bus. And um, so now we've got to uh, walk to a payphone. Our equipment guy walked to the payphone, called, this is pre-cell phones, calls the hotel they send the shuttle vans back to pick us up we check back into the hotel until they can drive a bus over from fort wayne in the morning that bus shows up at about 7 a.m we bus back to fort wayne we're half an hour from fort wayne the bus driver gets pulled over for speeding and it turns out he left his license in the other bus so we sit there on the shoulder for an hour while they try and figure out whether or not we stole the bus and where the identification was so that was my it was almost as if karma was giving me one final uh, send off from the CBA on my way out. <laughs> well, I mean, I can't think of a better metaphor and or exclamation <laughs> point, right? After all these years, though, and as times passed and, and, and your other career stops along the way. So, you know, and, and you know, the memory ha- is a tricky thing, right? Because it can clearly pave over hardships and things that uh, one wants to avoid and traumas, if you will, and stuff. But I, I get the sense, having talked to a couple of people now about the CBA and 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 frankly, just all the leagues and teams in the in the, the, in the realm of defunctness that uh, we've sort of traversed over the last two and a half years with this silly little show. Um, I got to think that more of the memories are are positive and and warm and fuzzy than they are sort of negative and or dour. I would agree with that completely. This has been um, when you and I talked. Um, and had our initial conversation to set up um, this longer conversation. Um, I, I spent a day or two going back through my archives and making some notes just so I would have um, my details correct on some things. And I, I told my wife after I spent a few hours in my office doing that, just how enjoyable it was to go back through old media guides and old books and just remember guys um, that I hadn't thought about in a long time. You know, I, a guy like Derek Gervin, who was George Gervin's little brother, a younger brother, I shouldn't say little, younger brother. Um, you know, he, he played in the NBA a little bit and 
played in Europe for a long time. He came back and played for us at the tail end of his career. He was 34 years old when he played for us in 97. He scored 27 points in 14 minutes in a game. Think about that a second. 27 points in 14 minutes. And um, just stuff like that. Or a guy like Lloyd Daniels, um, you know, a playground legend. You know, to, to, thinking about, I hadn't thought about Lloyd in years. Um, or a guy like Mucci Norris or Bruce Bowen, who, who you know, won a couple championship with the Spurs. We, you know, we had him for two games and then traded him because uh, they didn't think he could play. Well, he turned out to be pretty good. Um, guys like that, just thinking about guys that the common fan and the casual fan probably don't know and, and even maybe the diehards haven't thought about in years. But just to kind of go back through that process, there were so many things that I thought about uh, about my time in the league that just kind of made me smile. And, and yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Time, time – uh, tends to accentuate uh, the good things and, and, and fade out maybe the things that were a little um, distasteful that um, were tough to get through. Um, but you certainly remember the good times more. I, I had a, a friend of mine told me once that uh, you know he was a runner back uh, in his younger days in high school and college, and, and uh, he told me that the older he gets, the faster he gets as a younger man. So, you know, he remembers himself faster and faster as a younger man every year he gets older. So I think it's the same kind of premise. All right. Last question. You live in the Indianapolis area now. I don't know how much you get back to, to Fort Wayne, but but the Mad Ants, right, the current uh, G League team now, part of the uh, which is uh, obviously the official uh, feeder uh, system and, and minor league, if you will, of, of the NBA, uh, to your knowledge, uh, how much or how little of uh, the Fury uh, story and stats and memories and whatever uh, is encompassed by or remembered by the Mad Ants, or is there uh, hands off or arm's length or not, uh, no relation whatsoever, or even remembrances of of what used to be in Fort Wayne before today's Mad Ants? Boy, that's a, that's a that's a great question, Tim. Um, I think there was initially when the Mad Ants started. Gosh, I'm I'm going to be up maybe off a year or two here back maybe 10, 11 years ago, their first coach was, was a friend of mine named Kent Davison, who was our assistant coach. And he actually was the last Fury coach. He was the Fury's head coach when, uh, when the CBA folded. So when I left, uh, Keith Smart left that same summer to go be an assistant in Cleveland. Uh, Kent Davison, who was our assistant, who actually was Keith's junior college coach uh, back in the 80s in Kansas. Kent was elevated to the head coach. So he was the Mad Ants' first coach. So I think when Kent was there, um, matter of fact, my son and I were in the building when he coached his first game there in Fort Wayne as the Mad Ants coach. I think there was that connection, but over time, um, it, it's it's non-existent anymore. I think, um, you know, the way the league ended in bankruptcy, a lot of stuff, most everything that was Fury associated um, in Fort Wayne either ended up, you know, you see it at I've been told you see it at garage sales or things like that. Um, but a lot of that stuff, certainly the, all the archives and everything that was in the office, unfortunately ended up in a landfill. Um, so there's not a lot of stuff left. And um, um, I, my, the, the guy that was my boss, uh, Scott Sprout, he ended up going to work for the Comets then. And he's had a successful multi-decade run as an executive with the Comets, the hockey team in town. And I was, talking with him a couple months ago and and I mentioned to him that I'm in the process I'm not sure why I did it at the time but I'm so glad I did now um I had uh the foresight I guess back years ago when I was doing Fury games to record the broadcasts on cassettes and so I have and I'm in the process of getting those moved over and convert over to mp3 files but but I have probably somewhere I don't know, 175, 200 games on cassette. And uh, he made the comment to me that, that, that largely the only archival uh, remnants of the Fury's existence um, exists in my, in my den. Well, that's, you know, that's especially interesting because I, one of the themes that we sort of elicited uh, in our various journeys around teams and leagues and stuff and some of what you've, you've heard is, is, you know, uh, there are leagues that, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, like Major League Soccer relative to the old North American Soccer League, right? I mean, there are teams literally that are named the same and and arguably have some kind of uh, direct connective tissue. And it's interesting to sort of see how conveniently people want to remember and or don't want to remember based on, you know, how positive or negative those associations are perceived. And, you know, I, in this case, even even more, I guess, uh, uh, questionable or, or nonlinear, right? Because the, the, the CBA doesn't exist anymore, but also, but it also established, or I, I guess really, if you really look at it longitudinally, reestablished professional basketball in Fort Wayne, right? And you, you could make the argument, as I'm sure many have, that the Mad Ants wouldn't exist in Fort Wayne without sort of the 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 successes of of the CBA franchise that preceded it, and and even if you harken back to you know the original Fort Wayne Pistons back in the fifties. Oh, I would agree. I would agree with that completely. I I would I would contend that there would be uh, there would be no Mad Ants in Fort Wayne if it wasn't for the Fury demonstrating that professional basketball could work in Fort Wayne. Um, and it's a different dynamic now because the Pacers bought the team uh, a few years ago, so they're one of the, and that's that's kind of the model that the G League is going to, where the the NBA teams actually own the G League teams. Um, so the Pacers have gone to that model, um, but yeah, there's really no no direct connection. You certainly walk into the arena, um, into the Coliseum, and there's nothing. They've got some pictures up of different events that have occurred in the building over the years, um, and there's nothing in that kind of display arrangement that would lead anybody to to realize that there was a professional basketball team that played in that building throughout the decade of the 90s, you know, 28 nights a year. Yeah, not even a throwback or that kind of thing. I, that's interesting, too. I mean, it, it's clear, too, that that becomes a regionalization strategy, right, for the NBA franchises, right? It allows them to you know, sort of be more community minded. Uh, it, it puts their their feeder team, you know, within their region uh, to kind of help sort of stir up, you know, beyond just the city limits kind of uh, uh, interest in in the in the big team. Uh, it, it seems like it's a it's a reasonable model, but um, y- you sort of uh, wince a bit in that uh, some of the history that maybe got some of those pieces there uh, gets uh, potentially whisked away without sort of Somebody maybe raising their hand and or throwing out a clip or, you know, uh, maybe resurrecting the old logo in a jersey or, or you know, even suggesting the idea of, God forbid, what, what, the G League is certainly a place for a, throw, a throwback game. You know, I mean, nobody's oh, gonna hurt by no that. question. And and I, I wish, um, you know, unfortunately, when I was in the league, that was um, that was after the league had the contract with the ESPN. So, I mean, you can I mean, I, and I know you've done it you can go on YouTube and watch CBA games from the late eighties uh, back when the, when the league had a contract with ESPN, there's probably 10 or 15 full games on YouTube. Um, so there just, there isn't a whole lot of footage or be it video via audio of that time period in the mid nineties, you know, even the early nineties, late nineties uh, of the CBA. And there was so much good basketball. There were so many um, really good players that came through the league and, and, um, it's unfortunate that a lot of that has has kind of uh, gone away, um, just uh, only remain in people's memories. So it's it's great that that you do things like this, not just to keep the keep the CBA or the Fort Wayne Fury alive, but just you know different all these different leagues and teams. Um, there's so many great stories out there that um, you know it's a shame that not all of them can be captured and and archived and saved. Uh, but it's great when they are. It's funny that um, because I, I, when I left the Clippers in 2003 uh, and moved back home to Indianapolis, I got out of the sports business altogether and, and actually bought my father's financial planning business and um, was looking to uh, try and stay involved in sports in some way. And uh, in, in oh, 2007, uh, got connected with uh, a local high school and started calling their games on the radio here locally. And um, occasionally we'll work with student broadcasters at the high school and have them do games with me and to kind of get them prepared to go to college and, and continue to, to maybe become professional broadcasters. Uh, and that's been great. I've really enjoyed that. Uh, but, but I was doing a game 
and um, this was probably five or six years ago. And um, and I don't even know where this, how I came up with this or where this started, but back, way back in the Fort Wayne days when I was 25, um, the first game I did, uh, I, I can remember it like it happened last week. We were in Quad City. The first time one of our guys hit a three, and back then, you know, the three-point shot was not as prevalent as it is now. So hitting a three was kind of like, oh, you only had like four or five of those a game for the team. So it was kind of a big deal. So one of our guys hit a three, and I just yelled, bang, really loud. I said, bang, he got it. And that kind of became my three-point thing. Inside two minutes, Norris out front to Bailey. Damon thought about the drive on Bowman. Instead, he swings it left wing to Savoy. Into Ham, fumbled it, got it back. Four to shoot. Cross court, Mikey. Now Mooch. Left to jack up another three right side. Bang! He got it again! Oh, Mooch is unconscious! He's in three in a row! And it's 49 47. Can you believe it? And I just, I just kept it and, and have carried that through. Well, fast forward to four or five years ago, I'm doing a high school game. Kid hits a three, and I say, bang, he got it. And we go to commercial, and the kid said, you got that bang thing from Mike Breen, right? I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, that's what Mike Breen says when somebody hits a three. I said, I, and so to prove to him that I wasn't making that up, I pulled out a cassette. And of course, when he looked at the, you know, this kid's 17 years old, I pulled out a cassette player. and He looked at me like I was crazy. Um, but I pull out and played a cassette for him from me from 1995 using that call and then he believed me that I didn't that I actually came up with that on my own. All right, our thanks to Rob Brown for a uh, surprisingly uh, interesting and deep discussion. I I learned uh, quite a bit. I keep learning more and more each and every conversation that we have. Uh, But the CBA is something that I have more of a peripheral vision around and memories of but uh this was uh, this is pretty darn interesting stuff and i also think it's especially uh, interesting to look at uh, the past as kind of the prelude to today and as you heard rob uh, allude to at uh, the fort wayne mad ants of uh, the uh, g league arguably and maybe not so arguably would not be there today and and as successful as they've been uh without sort of that uh, foundational uh decade or so of the fury and the CBA and uh, establishing and frankly keeping the flame alive of of pro basketball beyond the city limits of Indianapolis uh, in the state of Indiana, the basketball mad state uh, of Indiana. Don't forget the Fort Wayne Pistons, right, where the Detroit Pistons originated way back when was evidence that, you know, basketball was uh, certainly significant, not only in the major metropolitan area of Indianapolis, but also uh, the outlying cities and and colleges and whatnot. And, and it continues to be. Indiana is still very much a, uh, a huge basketball uh, center and, and locus. And uh, the Fort Wayne Mad Ants certainly continuing part of that history and that legacy. So we thank Rob for taking time from his civilian life and uh, to regale and uh, remember some of his uh, his past exploits behind the mic with the Fury and the ye old. CBA. We want to say thank you to our uh, production friends at Podfly Productions, in particular, of course, the good and masterful doctor. His name is Jerry Payne, and he puts all of our collected pieces together. You can find out more about him and them at Podfly Productions. Their website is podfly.net. And uh, we also want to remind you that our website is uh, goodseatsstillavailable.com. And of course, that's the place to go for everything you want to know about this show. Any of the old episodes that you want, all the 100 and almost 30 episodes or so now, are out there and available for you on the website. Uh, You can download them, you can stream them, you can do whatever you want with them. Just, uh, you know, be careful and, uh, you know, don't break anything when you do so. It's also the place to find uh, all of our social media feeds. And then on Twitter, you're going to find us at Good Seats Still. On Instagram, you can follow us at Good Seats Still Available. You will find a Facebook page to us. All the links to those, uh, if you can't remember that, are on our website at goodseatstillavailable.com. Yes, of course, you can buy books and various videos and all the things that we talk about in previous episodes and stuff. All of our great sponsors like 503 Sports and Streaker Sports and OldSchoolShirts.com and SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. You'll find links uh, to all of those great thematic uh, websites and all their great wares. You hear us touting about them all the time. 
why don't you go over there and uh, to the website and click through there and uh, all those uh, promo codes and all those links will, uh, will be automatically there for you to enjoy and get those discounts and savings courtesy of us. And let's see what else on the website. You can also get our email newsletter. Sign up for that there. Uh, you can send us email from the website or send it to us directly if you want to. And we're at hello at good seats still available. Dot com. All right. I think that's enough. Don't you think? Sure. Again, we appreciate your listening. Uh, we appreciate, of course, your inquiries and your suggestions. And uh, we look forward to uh, just overwhelming you with more excitement next week. Until then, we'll see you. And uh, we appreciate your listening. Bye bye. Bye.